Welcome to O-State Daily. Casey Porter here on a glorious podcast as the Oklahoma State Cowboys took down the heavily favored Kansas State Wildcats last Friday in front of a sellout crowd at Boone Pickens Stadium. Both I and hey, my partner here, Chase Witwiska, we were both there. What a wonderful atmosphere that was. Coach Gundy called it Bedlam-esque. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was a ton of fun. Uh, you know, the blackout and um, just the the environment with the fans and the energy and the things like that in the stadium are, are ones that I haven't felt in a while, you know, and I, I've attended every home game for, heck, I don't know how many years from being a student and now being season ticket holder and things like that. Um, I would say that's very comparable to what it felt like uh, a few years ago when we played OU, uh, Caleb Williams being quarterback and, and uh, Colin Oliver getting that last sack, man, it was, uh, it, it was pretty similar. It was. It was. Hey, you know, and the last time we talked, Chase, one of your big keys was OSU has to come out very creative on offense early in the game, and they need to score on that first drive. Boy, check and check, right? Yeah, no, they absolutely they, – they looked like Oklahoma State. Um, I texted you right after that first drive, and I said, Oklahoma State football's back. Um, you could just tell, you know, with, it's fine. with all the – yeah, with all the motions and all the creativity and stuff like that, I was – I was kind of surprised, you know, we've seen such a, a vanilla offense so far this season. And even going back into last season a little bit, I know Spencer Sanders was hurt when he was with us, um, you know, towards the end of the season. So the, the offense got very, very simplified. Um, but it looks like, you know, motions and, and all the good stuff's back. No doubt about that. And, hey, you know, I know the, the reverse and the reverse pass, those are all fun. You know, those are trick plays. When I talk about being creative, I think you too as well, Chase. When I, I mentioned being creative, I don't necessarily mean trick plays. I mean, like, be creative within the base concepts that you run. Like, don't just run zone right or zone left. You know, gap scheme a little bit. And, and, you know, like the one run that Ollie Gordon went on for however long it was. You know, it was a gap scheme play to where you pull the right guard and then Ollie Gordon – you know, that the linebacker gets over the top of it. Ollie Gordon, once that linebacker gets over the top, he cuts it back underneath and the right tackle's hinging and you have this big hole. You know, those kind of creative ways of figuring out ways to run the ball and then just the execution of the pass game, just the routes that that, that guys were running. You know, it, it just – it was really – you know, you could tell they had a week off because they weren't just running routes. They were running routes with a purpose as to how to attack a defense. And it really, really was a just a beautifully executed game. Yeah, I mean, it was awesome. Um, and, and you're 100% right. You know, in terms of creativity, I don't just mean, you know, the, the reverses and stuff like that, but the different um, schemes that you use with the O-line and the different reads and stuff like that. Um, creativity, uh, another thing that comes to mind, especially in that first drive, is, is Bowman pulled the ball. You know, he yes. was reading that he was reading an end and the end crashed and he pulled and, and got a pretty good gain out of it. Um, I mean, that's what creativity is to me. Um, it, it's yeah. not just like you said, a power or a zone right or zone left or let's just run straight slants. Um, you know, there were different route combos involved and all kinds of stuff. It was great. No doubt about it. Hey, if you're to nitpick, though, the offense, I think, was good. I think if you're to nitpick, you'd have to nitpick. Still inside the scoring zone, not good getting the ball in the end zone. And then also finishing the game. You got to finish the game. Nick Martin gives you the interception. You got to put the game away right there. You got to figure out a way to get a first down and put the game away. I think if you nitpicked, I think you could nitpick those two areas. I agree 100%. You know, uh, and Coach Gundy talked about it in, in his press conference and stuff like that. You know, they've got to find ways to get in the end zone because um, he said it, you know, here in a couple of weeks, you know, when the, when the competition gets even tougher – Heck, you could even look at this week. I don't think five field goals is going to cut it against Kansas. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that they're going to have to find ways to punch the ball in the in the, in the end zone. You know, and and I thought, um, you know, I, I thought that the play calling got a little bit less aggressive and a little bit less creative in the red zone. You know, I, I don't know if it's just a lack of, you know, hey, we've only got 10, 15 yards to work with. Um, I'm not sure where that came from. Um, but do use what – use what got you all the way down there, you know, I mean, keep, keep running those plays. And I know that, you know, some of it has been installed, so they may not have been comfortable with it. You know, we can't afford to, to get a five yard penalty on a false start and, you know, go from the 20 to the 25. It's a big difference. Um, but like I said, you've you got to find a way to punch it in. You know what I think OSU needs? What's that? To, you know, to, to go directly to those two issues that we're talking about. Why not go Ollie Gordon, Brennan Presley, Jaden Nixon in the backfield? And yeah. just run a pretty badass Wildcat set. 
Yeah, uh, you could do that, or you could even throw a Bowman back there too and run a little bit of a diamond. Um, you can run triple options. You can run breed options. You can do all kinds of stuff with those with those three guys in the backfield, you know, and those are the three guys you want to get the ball to. Um, Presley being super quick and, 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 uh, and moves really, really well. You got Ollie Gordon, um, who, who's just a, a powerful, fast, strong, physical guy. He's good. Um, and then Jaden Bray, he's another he's another decent sized kid, but he's fast. He's really fast, um, and, and he's a big playmaker. Yeah, Rashad Owens. I tell you what, I was super impressed with his route running ability. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that dude. Hey, and that slant that he ran that he got down to like the one or two. Just watching him drive his defender down to about the three Mm -hmm. and then instead of just slanting and running right into the safety he just kind of turned around and posted up yeah i mean that was a very impressive play in terms of execution he made it look really easy but man you could tell he was coached up on exactly how to do it and he did it exactly how he was coached up and then he ran with a purpose and got all the way down there to where ollie gordon could score a couple plays later yeah, and I'll say it. Um, I, I've never – I don't know if I've ever been able to say this, um, you know, as long as I've been a, a fan and stuff like that, but hats off to Casey Dunn this week, man. He did yeah. He did a great – he did a good job. You know, he, he, did. He, he did a good job getting him, getting him down the field. I do think that he could be better in the red zone, um, but I think that especially coming out that first drive of the game um, and really setting the tone for how the game's going to go. You know, the, the offense is driving down the field. You get the fans into it. Um, you, you see the reverses, you see the motions, all that stuff. It gets the fans excited. Um, and then you, you and look the at the players. Right. I was about to say, you, you look at the players and how they were playing just in that first, that first drive, you know, and it lasted throughout the entire game. They were, they were excited. They were having a good time. Um, they were fired up and they were, they were ready to go. They, they were tired of, you know, being, uh, just that team that, that somebody kind of looked at as, Oh, you know, Kansas state gets a win this week. And, and and so on. I think that uh, I think that hit home a little bit. Um, not only with the players, but the coaching staff. Um, I th- I think that it was, um, you know, if you look at the way they came out, it was they were excited and they were ready to go. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about it that they heard all the outside noise, including the coaches, and they took it personal. They took it as a challenge. And hey, you know, we know when Mike Gundy's painted into a corner, he comes out fighting. There's no doubt about it. He's definitely a fighter. So schematically, Chase. You know, we've had many different conversations over the last several years. Super frustrated with the way this offense was headed from a schematical perspective. Just way too vanilla for the type of athletes you're recruiting. And then the NIL hits, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're not even dealing with kids that you've coached up. So you got to be more creative. You know, like, okay, so this last week, you're talking about the run game. They've incorporated that gap scheme back into it where, hey, like, if you're running the ball left – Everybody's blocking right, and then you're pulling one guard or one tackle back to the left, and you're kicking out kind of like the old trap play. Mm -hmm. You know, I love this gap scheme that OSU's running. For one, I think it suits Ollie Gordon. I don't think Ollie Gordon is a zone back. I don't think he's a guy like a Barry Sanders or a Thurman Thomas or a Gerald Hudson or a David Thompson or a Kendall Hunter or a Dantrell Savage. I don't think he's in, in that vein of back, or or most recently, Jeff, uh, what was the uh, Jalen Warren, I should say, mm. and or Justice Hill. I don't think he's that type of zone back where you just give him the ball, you give him a three way go, you know, in a zone play, you you can bend it, you know, you can cut it back, you can bust it up the middle, or you can bounce it outside. I don't think he's that three way go guy. I think he's a gap scheme back, and what I mean by that is, in a gap scheme. You know, hey, you're blocking one way, you're kicking the other. And so the whole goal for the running back is to get behind the the block down and the kick, right? That defines the role for the running back. I think he's that type of downhill runner. I think he's a one-cut, one-cut back type runner like we've seen. Once he gets that one cut back, he gets it in gear, he gets going downhill, and he's a load. So I think this offense has found the exact type of blocking scheme, the exact type of running game, that suits the personnel they have. Plus, then when you look at what they did on the passing game, you're talking about scat concepts. You're talking about you know stick draw concepts. You're talking about a quarterback who's reading one safety. If the safety comes up and plays run, he dumps it off to Josiah Johnson. If the quarterback stays back and he plays pass, then you hand it off to a guy like Jaden Nixon or Braden Presley so that they have a lot of air raid concepts in their pass game. They have the old K-State gap scheme in the run game with a K-State type running back, it, to me, this is the most excited schematically I have been about OSU's offense in a long time. Yeah, and they 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 have weapons. You know, they, they, they do. They do. They, they, I wouldn't say that they um, necessarily are, are 
like super top tier, um, if you will, you know, when you compare them to everybody else in the nation, but um, they have really, Ollie really Gordon's good. pretty good, man. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm more talking about receivers and stuff like that. Um, and, and that's not to knock down the receivers because we have a good set, you know, but you also, you don't have a Tylen Wallace like you used to um, James Washington, but you do have a really, really good Brennan Presley. Yes. Um, you have, I mean, you, you have so many weapons that you can use. Um, and what I, what I liked and what I wanted to see was, was, to use them in different ways, you know, use the, use Presley in the motion. I'm sure he ran a billion yards and in, in, in motions and routes and all that stuff. Um, I, I like it. And I, I'm sure he does too, because it opens, it opens things up for him a little bit. Um, what they're going to end up doing is they're going to run motion and eventually he's going to be one-on-one with a linebacker um, or somebody's going to be out of, you know, out of, out of position or reading the wrong key. And he's going to, he's going to be wide open. He's going to be able to make a big play. Um, you know, he, I think he got six touches this weekend, um, which Still is not more, a, right. Which is not enough. Um, but he had more targets. Um, I can think of two passes that, um, uh, one, I think he maybe could have caught the, the deep ball down the, I would agree. I think he would be the first one to tell you should have caught that ball down the right side of the field. Yeah. Um, and then there, there was one, I think it was in the red zone, um, where it, I mean, it was just a little high. He he jumped up and he got his legs taken out from under him. Yeah. That, that's a tough play for anybody to make. Um, slam play. So the targets were there. Um, the targets were there. Um, so I'm hoping that they continue to do that and then also you know continue to use Ollie Gordon like they should. Super super impressed with Alan Bowman. I don't think his numbers go to show exactly how good he was. 19 to 35. One of my keys for pregame, he's needed, he needed to be 60% in the pass game. I think he was right around 54 55%, whatever 19 and 35 is. I think that's somewhere around there. So close to that, but I don't think that goes to show just how effective he was. You mentioned the weapons. This team ha- has enough weapons. Josiah Johnson, you know, you're talking about uh, Jaden Bray, Brendan Presley, Ollie Gordon, Jaden Nixon, Rashad Owens. This team has enough weapons. All Alan Bowman has to do is, it's figure out which weapon is meant to get the ball to on which individual play. And if that weapon's not open, then check it down. Something he did just a tremendous job of Friday night. And that's why there was eight different receivers that caught passes was because when the, the initial target was not open, he just checked it down and went to the, to the next guy. And or he just threw the ball away, which I think that's why he had a little bit lower percentage because you mentioned this on the last podcast. One of the advantages of playing the whole game is if you're the quarterback in the first quarter and you know you're going to play the whole game, you don't mind punting, right? right? Because you don't want to turn the ball over. If that's your only series you're going to get or if you at your last series, you're not throwing that ball away. You're trying to make a play even if it ends up in an interception, right? So I think, I think Alan Bowman – was extremely good. I think he did exactly what the coaches asked him to do, pretty much exactly the way they wanted him to do it. So I, I think he was very good. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to be the first to say, you know, if, if you've watched our previous <clears throat> podcast, you know, we were talking about uh, when we were going through the three quarterback rotation and stuff like that, I had Bowman listed as my three. I was wrong. Um, I, I, I was wrong. Um, and he, he's done a fantastic job these last two weeks. Um, Iowa State, he played okay. Um, but you, I think you can definitely say he played a lot better against Kansas State. And while he didn't have any touchdowns, he also didn't have any interceptions. Um, but they moved the ball really, really well. Um, and then you talk about his check downs and stuff like that. That's where his um, experience comes in handy. Um, he, he knows how to read defenses. And I think that he's finally getting comfortable with the Oklahoma State offense and his weapons around him, um, that he's able to, you know, know what decisions to make. Um, I, I think he looks, he looks really good. I'll take it a step further than that. I think he's adding to this offense. I think he's putting some of the Texas Tech air raid elements that he had at Texas Tech. I think he's helping incorporate some of them back into the offense. Some of the the one safety reads where you make the safeties wrong, OSU hasn't been doing a lot of that stuff. Most of their RPOs in the last four or five years have been pre-snap, meaning the quarterback has two plays You know, whenever, whenever they, they get it in from the sideline. And you read the box, and if the box tells you to pass, then you pass. If the box tells you to run, you run. Mm -hmm. That's the type of RPOs OSU's been running last four or five years. The types of RPOs that Alan Bowman ran last week were post-snap, where he was actually reading a half player, a safety, an outside linebacker, a different guy on every play. So I honestly think he has actually added that element back to the OSU offense. 
Yeah, he has, and it, and it's been. Um, I, I think it's been easier to to call plays in the past just because of how athletic Spencer Sanders was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it was really simple for for them to call one play, um, and if it breaks down, you can trust that you know with how athletic and how fast he was um, that he was able to to make a wrong call right. Um, I, I don't necessarily know that he had to read a whole lot um, necessarily. You know, I, I think he was you know reading one guy um, if it, if it was post snap. Um, and if that one guy was either covered or, you know, the safety did something that he didn't like or look, the backer or whoever he was reading, um, he was able to just take off because he was so athletic and so quick, um, you know, and he, and he just made wrong calls right with his athleticism. You want to know the key to the offense Friday night beyond everything we've talked about? What's that? Zero sacks. Yeah. Now, one of the things, the reason why you wanted to go with Gunner Gundy was because you felt like our offensive line – struggled to the point to where you didn't think you could have a stationary quarterback in the backfield, which made total sense at the time because they couldn't protect anybody. Right. But I think the fact that, you know, you're running that gap scheme and then you're also play actioning off of that gap scheme, then you also have a quarter have a quarterback that's willing to check it down before he gets sacked. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a huge factor. You know, when you're talking about – with this offense does have weapons – but, you know, in the past when you have a James Washington, a Tylen Wallace, a, a Des Bryant, you know, a, a Justin Blackman, yeah. you know, when you have those type of guys, okay, so you get a seven-yard sack at second and 17. You know, you, you throw up a guy, uh, you throw up a jump ball. You know, it's second and 17, so you tilt James Washington. They roll all their coverage over to him. Then you just throw a jump ball up to Marcel Aitman, who high points it and gets you about 27 yards. This isn't that offense for OSU. They right. have to stay ahead of the chains. So having, you know, you can't take a sack on first down and make it sec- second and 17 with this offense because they are not going to be able to overcome that. So what Alan Bowman did was he kept them ahead of the chains. He gave Casey Dunn a chance to continue to call plays that were meant to actually get the next first down. Yeah. No, and I want to I want to talk about the offensive line for a second. You know, we we've I think we've both been, been been pretty tough on in the past few mm-hmm. weeks, and let's just be honest, they haven't played worth a darn. Um, but this week they came out and they played really, really well. Um, so hats off to them and, and Coach Dickey for getting them right this week. Um, you know, they, they had uh, 174 rushing yards against one of the top ten uh, rushing defenses in the nation, um, which is really, really impressive. Um, and had a 100-yard like, rusher. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then like you mentioned, um, zero sacks, which is huge. Um, which, you know, that, that also allows Bowman to, to feel a little bit more comfortable and he's not rushing things. Um, he's able to go through his progressions. Um, and, and if nobody's open, he, he showed a little bit of signs of, you know, he's able to move a little bit. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say he's necessarily the most um, agile when it comes to uh, making cuts and stuff like that because you can definitely tell he has to slow that big body down a little bit to, to make that cut. Um, but he's able to escape the pocket. And I will say he throws really, really good off of his back foot, mm-hmm. really good. Um, which is which is great, you know that that allows him to to uh, extend plays a little bit longer and also keep his eyes down the field. Um, one thing that I do like about him over Spencer Sanders is it looked like um, kind of I, I think when Spencer Sanders escaped the pocket, he was run first instead of looking down yes. the field to pass. Um, I think it's complete opposite with Bowman. Bowman keeps his eyes downfield. Um, he he knows himself. Um, he trusts his arm. Um, and and if I were him, I would trust my arm over my feet too. Mm-hmm. I think Spencer Sanders at times, as much as I loved him, you know that I was a huge, yeah. huge advocate of Spencer Sanders. I, I defended that kid, always will. I defended that kid to no end. I do think sometimes he made it hard to call plays because you would call a play and he would just give up on the initial part of the play so fast because he relied on his arm or his, his footwork so much where he would just kind of go do his own thing. Whereas Alan Bowman, he's going to stay more structured. He's going to allow a coach to draw up a play. He's going to stay within the structure of that play, and he's going to make it work. So from that perspective, I think right now Alan Bowman is is doing a very good job for Oklahoma State. Okay, man, how about that defense? I know they gave up. You know, when you look at the overall yardage, it doesn't look great as far as the the run game. But you got to remember, okay, OSU got out leveraged on the one 70-yard run by Will Howard where they went unbalanced. They actually had two tackles and a tight end back to the boundary. Oklahoma State just simply didn't identify it. They had a deep safety and a linebacker to that side, and that was it. They got outnumbered 4-2. to two. Will Howard went to 
uh, to the one-yard line with it. Okay, that happens. When you're running 70 plays and you're as funky as K-State is and you're lining up differently and you're doing unbalanced and you're doing this, you have motion, you have motion there, you're going to get misfit once or twice a game and give K-State credit, give Will Howard credit. They're good enough to make you pay when that happens. That's exactly what happens. So, hey, the one long run, okay, you know, whatever. I mean, it happens, right? But other than that, you take away the 70-yard run, which you can't, they all count, but you take away that. You just look at the conventional run game, you know, hey, just when they just handed it off in a conventional run game type way. Oklahoma State, we said this was a key. You get a lead on them. Then you stop the run game with your six-man box, which Oklahoma State did for the most part. Then at that point, they become one-dimensional. Then you put pressure on Will Howard. Will Howard has shown in the past that when you put pressure on him, he will become very inaccurate. We saw all of that happen Saturday. Yeah, and one thing that I want to point out, and I don't want people to uh, to forget, is this Kansas State offense, man. A lot of these guys were, were Big 12 champions last year, mm-hmm. um, their quarterback included. Um, So the fact that, you know, a a very – I want to make this an emphasis, a very young Oklahoma State uh, defense defense, was able to keep him that off balance and hats off to Nardo as well. He called a a great game. Um, I I do think they they could fit the run better at times. Um, But like you said, with how funky they are, uh, Kansas State and and stuff like that, sometimes things are going to break down, and that's what happens with youth. Um, You know, and I think things will get better as the season goes on and whatnot. Um, but Nick Martin, one guy that, that I want to point out, you know, 17 tackles. Uh, he had two and a half tackles for loss and a sack. Uh, that dude went off, With the- you know, and then you got Cameron Epps. Uh, I, I'm speechless. You know, he had a huge game, um, especially you know, just, potential. Just, just a freshman. You know, he's just a baby. Um, so a couple of years in this defense, man, I'm excited to see what he does. Very excited about the fact that uh, Nick Martin, <laughs> O State Daily ended up on his Instagram story. <laughs> oh, did it really? Yeah, yeah. I was scrolling through those. Like, hey, look at there. <laughs> he put my post about him, uh, the O State Daily post in his Instagram story. So that was really cool because when they do that, like you just sit there and watch the views. Just it's yeah. almost like yeah. it, you hit a jackpot <laughs> every time you update it. It's like there's 200 more views. So yeah, that was kind of fun because O State Daily with. Twitter and Instagram, you know, I'm getting like five, six, seven views, you know, because it's brand new and nobody knows anything about it. Then all of a sudden, hey, this dude actually noticed this. This It's cool. Plus, it was kind of funny because it was kind of fun because Josiah Johnson, he actually followed O State Daily and then Cameron Epps. He he uh, he actually commented on my po- on the O State Daily post about him on Instagram as well. So hey, it was a good weekend for O State Daily too. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You uh, you can't forget about us. You know we're we're doing our best. Yeah. We're we're brand new. You know we're we're, we're trying to make it run, a, a little bit of a run at something. Uh, do something a little bit different than than a lot of people do. Um, you know I, I do want to point out another guy. Um, he, he seemed quite kind of quiet in, in terms of the stats, but I think Colin Ol- Colin yes. Oliver had a heck of a game. You know, just um, he, he's kind of in a position right now to where he's not necessarily um, making a whole lot of big plays. Uh, he did have a batted down pass, which was huge. Um, but what he is doing um, that I don't think a lot of people notice is like I, I don't think a lot of people notice is he, he's he's spilling plays to other people. Um, he, he's he's uh, going head to head with with offensive linemen and stuff like that, and um, he's allowing other guys to come and make plays. Um, I think that goes a little bit unnoticed. Um, I, I do want to con- continue to see him in different stunts and stuff like that because I think that he's definitely a game changer. Um, but he's doing a great job right now of, of filling his role. Um, you know, and like I said, spilling spilling plays off to other guys and stuff like that is very unselfish football, and it's fun to watch. Man, how rangy is Trey Rucker? Trey yeah. Rucker, Cameron Epps in the backfield, Nick Martin at linebacker, you know, all young guys. And then who was the one that got – the one that they don't have right now, the Rawls, Lyric Rawls. Mm-hmm. Man, that is – that's an athletic secondary, man. Those are some dudes. Yeah, and, and they're, they're, all, they're all really young, you know. Uh, that's this what is, I mean. This is – I mean, this is, this is two and three years future of Oklahoma State defense and, and maybe four – you know, and if they continue to uh, to do things the way that they should and play uh, play the way they did this week, it's going to help in terms of recruiting. It's going to help, um, you know, in terms of who 
you know, you got a you got a very young offensive co- uh, defensive coordinator yeah. in Nardo, um, which I think is going to draw attention and, and, and draw a little bit of interest because um, he know you know he knows how to connect with guys a little bit better than maybe yeah. a seventy year old DC. What are you trying to say about us old guys? I'm hey I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying speaking from experience, you know, with with running a baseball organization yeah. at, at 23, 24 years old. Um, it definitely helps to have to have young blood in there and, and mm-hmm. have that to offer. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, so moving on to this week, going to be a totally different animal. You're talking about K State, who you know they like to unbalance you. They like to run that gap scheme. They like to run read scheme behind that. Kansas, hey man, coming in with Lance Leopold. He's had his both his coordinators for the last two spots. I know he at least had him at Buffalo. So hey, they do what they do. It's going to look complicated. There's going to be a lot of eye candy to it. There's going to be a ton of movement before the snap. And then there's going to be like three or four concepts. Mm -hmm. It's not as complicated as it looks. Once the ball is snapped, the key is going to be, you mentioned it, you have all these guys that are young, right? Can you get lined up whenever Kansas actually hikes the football and get in the proper position when they actually do hike the ball? That's going to be the key for Oklahoma State defensively. If Oklahoma State can get lined up and identify the motion and get lined down to it properly, then OSU will be fine. If they don't, then K-State's going to misfit it and have great athletes. Yeah, they, they are extremely athletic. They're extremely fast. Um, you know, the coaches have been around each other for a very long time, which also, you know, is very beneficial. Um, I think a lot, uh, and, and these guys go very, very, very unnoticed, um, but the scout team is going to yes. have a huge role this week um, because, because of how not necessarily complicated the Kansas offense is, but how much movement there is and how much athleticism there is, the scout team's going to play a huge role. Um, and for those of you that don't know who the scout team is, it's, it's guys that are just pretty much practice players that, um, you know, provide uh, the two visuals. Three. Yeah. Pr- 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 uh, provide that for the starters and, and stuff like that. They're, they're going to have a big role this week. No doubt about that. Don't think Jalen Daniels is going to play, but Ryan Bean, who has stuck around Kansas, the backup, very good quarterback. In fact, excellent quarterback. I think he'd start in a lot of Division One colleges. So, hey, good for him. He's decided in this day and age of, of transfer portal and all this going on, he has decided to stick at Kansas, although Jalen Daniels has continued to be named the starter ahead of him. Of course, I think Bean's actually played more than Daniels the last two yeah. years because Jalen Daniels has been hurt so much. But, hey, very good player there. So, KU, I think the one way that, that, that you – that you beat KU and and you you take them out of their game as you do what Texas did to them. You get a three or four score lead. At that point, KU then has to become a drop back passing team. You know, hey, they want to be able to run the ball, Mm -hmm. then they want to be able to throw those RPOs. Everything with Kansas is triple option based. Now, they're not going to be pitching it like the old wishbone, but they are going to have a run option to the running back, a pull option from the quarterback, and a third option to throw the ball forward. Those are your three options that a quarterback in a Kansas offense is going to have on every single play. So if you get a three-score lead, you can pretty much eliminate the first two options, right, because they don't have time to run the ball. And then you can just concentrate on the third option and then just start blitzing the quarterback. We saw that with Will Howard last week. That is going to be the recipe for LSU. We'll see if they can get it done. What you got to do against Kansas is score a lot of points early on them and get about a three score lead. You yeah. need to come out and empty the empty the, the kitchen sink against them early on and get a lead. What I, what I would like to see is mm-hmm. is you know how they can exactly how the offense. I know we're talking about defense, but I want to see the offense come out the exact same way they did against Kansas State. You know, guns blazing. Um, that there's you know they're not trying to save anything for later in the game. They're not afraid to uh, to show you what they've got. And um, I think that if they can, like you said, get a two three four score lead. Um, I think they're going to sit pretty. Um, I, I don't think the Kansas defense is very good, um, yeah. so that will definitely play to the Oklahoma State offense's you know, benefit. Um, but, like again, they, they have a, a very athletic um, offense, you know, and, and yeah. our defense being as young as they are, it's a, it's a little worrisome. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that if they're able to really nail down, you know, just not trying to do too much. Um, you know, if, if, if each guy sticks to his assignment and sticks to his reads, um, I think they're going to be just fine. I think what you do, um, 
I think that when you get into trouble, it's usually when, especially young guys, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're trying to make a name for themselves mm-hmm. and they try to make plays that they probably shouldn't be making, um, you know, trying, trying to, to, in, in all for benefit of the team. Um, but they, they try to make bigger plays than, than what's needed. Um, like I mentioned, you know, Colin Oliver, they, they need a, uh, 11 Colin Olivers this week. They need yep. 11 guys that are just willing to fill their role, um, spill things off, uh, stay, stay connected to their guy, read their, read their key, um, and, and just trust the other 10 guys around them that they're going to do the same. So, you know, your best defense this week is going to be a good ball controlling offense. But I think that has to be after you've unloaded the kitchen sink, after you've built about a two or three score lead. The difference between Kansas and Kansas State. Oklahoma State built the lead against K-State. K-State has a good enough rush defense to where if you kind of shut down your offense like OSU did and try start playing offense to kill clock, you're going to go three and out against K-State, right? Yeah. Because their run defense is good. I think OSU is going to be, even if they don't score, if they get a lead and they and they try to start you know, slowing things down to keep the ball away from Kansas. I think you're going to be able to churn out a few more first downs against this Kansas defense, which will kill more of the clock. So there is a recipe there for Oklahoma State to control this game. That would be it. So hopefully we see it. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I don't um, – one thing that I want to say, I, I don't want to see them really take their foot off the gas this week. Um, I think that with the momentum you have coming out of Friday's game, I think you use that to your advantage. And I, I, I mean, in all respect to Kansas, you try to hang a hundred on them if you can. Um, I, I don't think that you need to let That's up. That's respect for them because they can come back on. We've seen that. They can come back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, I, I, I don't want to see them let up. Um, I, I want to see, um, I want to see the first draft of Kansas state for four quarters for an entire four yeah. quarters, whether, whether they're up or down by fit. I don't Good care. Point. It doesn't matter. I want to see, the first drive of Kansas State for four quarters. If they do that, they're going to be an extremely, extremely hard team to beat. Again, you know, with anybody in the Big 12, whoever they match up with. Um, I think that if, if they do that and they they stick to that game plan for four quarters, I think they're going to be a really hard team to beat. I think Coach Gundy is absolutely correct. If you have to kick five field goals against Kansas, it's going to be done in a losing cause. I yes. don't think there's any doubt about that because KU – they're a different animal. They can score. I mean, K-State can score too, but K-State can – I mean, Kansas can score in bunches. So, it's just going to be a different type of game. That's what makes the Big 12 so fun is that it seems like every week, you know, hey, you have the Iowa State who has the, the odd stack that funnels everything. They kind of want to play everything in a phone booth offensively. Then you have K-State who's kind of in the middle. They don't run a lot of RPO stuff. A little bit odd stack, a little bit more – diverse defensively and then here you have the basketball on grass the next week so you know the diversity of getting to see different types of teams is super fun in the big 12 so hey going to be there at 2 30 saturday absolutely all right man hey chase thanks for joining absolutely have a good one all right fans thank you for joining our o-state daily podcast and until next time i want to thank you for tuning in and say go pokes